So Roberto is back. He's going to talk about point of care echo. Where do we stand? Echo in your pocket. <laughs> echo in your pocket. Is that right, Roberto? Echo in your pocket. OK, uh, everybody, hello again. Uh, I am going to talk, as uh, Dr. Martin just said, about the point uh, of care echocardiography. Let me tell you that there is no, I think, topic that has so many different types of names. You know, people called it handheld, compact echo, portable, personal ultrasound imager, ultra portable, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> These are all publications, but it seems that Dr. Zogby likes point of care. <laughs> so uh, that's why he put that uh, title. So I think that in order to talk about this, we first need to talk about Moore's law. This is a photograph of uh, Mr. Moore. He was the CEO of Intel. And he actually said that computers and processor speeds or the overall processing power for computers will double every two years. And he was absolutely right. And this has happened from the 70s till today. And this Moore's law is what has enabled this revolution with the small ultrasound machines. This idea started in 1978, the year where Argentina won the soccer world championship. <laughs> but in, 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 that, in that year, Dr. Roland uh, started with this uh, idea of a small ultrasound machine. And then we have seen rapidly throughout the years as the computers advanced, how the echo machines actually uh, shrunk. Uh, luckily, also, as we got smaller, the prices got smaller, but uh, the full platform machines are still very expensive. And you know that if you open a big echo machine inside it, they are just a couple of computer boards. The bigger the machine, the more we pay. But uh, you see how this sort of portable machines have a decreased both in the size and also a... Now, what is actually very interesting is that if you think about it, in the world, there are, more, there are as many cell phone subscriptions, about 77 billions, as there are people on this earth. So there is obviously many people have more than one phone. And it took only 20 years for this to happen. And uh, therefore, it is not surprising that in this year, we have seen now the introduction of the mobile ultrasound uh, machines that are connected to your phone. It's a sort of fantastic thing. You have a transducer. You connect it through the port to your phone. And through the, you, you download the sort of whatever you need to make it work in your echo machine to display it. And all what is need to create the image is inside the transducer. And these, of course, are very, and these are the types of images that you get, which are, I don't tell you, completely comparable with a high end, but they are getting there. And this year, I think we have seen also a, a revolution, which is the fact that, a, again, a phone, a machine that connects to your phone a, has been developed. And the, the great sort of idea here is that this ultrasound machine does not use piezo crystals in order to generate the image. It does that electronically. So the, this is, is made by a sort of an electronic bouncer that creates the vibrations to create this energy. This has the potential of reducing the price of these echo machines tremendously. If you go, they're already sort of advertising this as the initial price for $2,000, which is a huge decrease from you know, V-Scan and other ultrasound machines. Images are very good. It has also the advantage that with one transducer, you can image vascular, the heart, and other, any types of things. This uh, type of, uh, uh, this is now imaging with this new type of ultrasound machine. They have incorporated, again, 
some automated intelligence into their echo machine, which is this viewer here that actually guides the operator as to get the correct position in the chest to get an optimal view. So you have already sort of uh, introduced intelligence into this uh, thing in order to guide you and so on. So I think this has a big, I think, potential to actually not only revolutionize this, but also all of ultrasound uh, in general. When you talk about, I think, uh, ultrasound, now I'm going to ask some questions that I don't think we all have answers, but, you know, there are two, there are different types of ultrasound studies. We all know that, but as it pertains, uh, I, I would like to define what is a limited study and what is a directed, focused ultrasound study. And I think we all understand that a limited study is a study that we do in the echo lab every day that requires the same knowledge, the same training, the same acquisition expertise, the same platforms that the large machine, the only thing that is different is that the clinical question to be addressed requires a limited numbers of images. And then we have what is called the direct focused ultrasound. And this is an acquisition of ultrasound that is intended to address a very specific question. And here, the equipment, the imaging expertise, and so on, is way below that required for the performance of an echocardiogram. So I think uh, you know, the problems that all of this industry that is exploding will have to address is that this focused ultrasound or point of care ultrasound is being performed by an increased number of physicians. And of course, these physicians are not board or echo certified. And probably many of the people doing it think that they are competent to use these ultrasound machines for real life diagnosis. So I see that is definitely a problem that has happened. Who's going to use this test? A whole variety of people uh, that include students and registered nurse and, and so on, general internists. So I think that one of the things that the industry has to grapple with is that the ASC and the National Board of Examiners does not have a certification pathway for these ultrasound machines. So we will need to have or create some sort of evidence-based certification pathway that can allow to separate those that are competent and those that are not. I think another problem that exists is that many of our guidelines are dependent on the number as a prerequisite of the number of studies that we do. And in a fellowship, that is OK, because you're trained. But outside, it's complicated, because you can do many studies and then do not have any type of diagnostic accuracy. So I think that that is something that we will also need to deal with. So how do we, as ASC, create a certification pathway? How do we establish a small numbers of studies and these are all things that we, that we will need to deal with. Let me show you just some very uh, things. I personally think that this machine has a phenomenal place as an extension of physical examination. A couple of years ago, I did a study in which, uh, you know, the way that we teach physical examination to medical students is very poor. You know, we do it with phonocardiograms and with classroom instruction, and then we sh let them hear this audio tapes, hard sounds, and then we take them to the clinic where there's a lot of sound and everybody pretends to hear a murmur. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the limitations, meaning uh, there, there are many, many limitations. So, you know, I, I did a, and, and since Lainek introduced his stethoscope from in 1819, to now, there is very little that has really changed in the, in the stethoscope. We have these cables of different colors, tubing, but that's about it. So when you, when you look at this study and you see, this is an interesting study in which they gave different murmurs to cardiology fellows, medical residents, and medical students. And I was very surprised to hear, to, to find out 
that, for example, for the AI murmur, medical students are much better than cardiology fellows. <laughs> so that is sort of very interesting. And when, when, you, when you think about uh, opening snaps uh, in mitral stenosis, only medical residents hear them, no students or fellows. So I think, I don't know if we're maybe choosing fellows that have auditive problems, but anyway, we, we did a, a study in which we, I took my colleagues in the echo lab, they all are younger than me, they have still have not lost their audition. And uh, so we, co they are all echo certified and whatever. So we compared in patients what their diagnostic capability was with a stethoscope and compared what they would do with an echo machine. And these board certified physicians, you can see that on physical, and I took patients that had all diagnosis that theoretically should be able to do with the stethoscope, and they actually missed 43% of the cases. So when you go to a physician, it's half and half. They all use a stethoscope because it is a status symbol of his physician. So then when they use the handheld ultrasound, you can see that they only missed 21% of these diagnoses. So then we took a group of, of students at the University of Chicago. These are usually much, much cleverer than, than the physicians. It goes down. The best we have are the students. And we taught them uh, the use of ultrasound. So uh, we first took two weeks to teach them in a, the traditional way. So we did first a skill assessment with stethoscope on day one, then after teaching them in a traditional way, and then we taught them another two weeks of ultrasound training. And interestingly, you can see that the correct diagnosis actually improved, almost doubled, when they, after the training with uh, echo training. So that, I think, is, is very interesting, and I would like to share with you what I found in JAMA. There was this article that says, physical exam, physicians wave goodbye. The AMA held a large funeral service today in honor of the physical exam, which passed away earlier this month after a decade-long battle with obscurity. The funeral was attended by nurses, medical doctors, and trainees all over the country who wished to pay their respects. <laughs> Being a foreign uh, person in this beautiful country, I am also very happy to see that U.S. patients have lower mortality rates with foreign trained doctors. <laughs> and that's probably because foreigners still know how to auscultate a little bit better. I, I wish to believe. I don't know if that is true. <laughs> but when you look at the directed bedside uh, uh, evaluation, there was a beautiful, uh, actually, a study uh, that Dr. Zogby was the, the senior author on point of care echo in which they put together all the studies and looked at in which type of situation these machines help and you can see that they have very quite sensitivity and specificity in all of these left ventricular dilatation, systolic function, ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial dilatation, et cetera, et cetera. So this is definitely a, a really good tool. And if you take that tool and then you put them into the different diagnosis, if you can measure chamber dimensions, you can use it in heart failure. If you look at the ventricle, you can look at that shock and so on and so forth. So another uh, thing that I would like to share is that Screening is another fantastic thing that can be done, and the American Society of Echo has been a very a leader in the use of this point-of-care echoes screening, and this is actually a study in which you can see that a great amount of uh, physicians here were using these small ultrasound uh, studies in India in order to make a, a, to get uh, information. And, in that particular situation, we have always problems in our, um, in our hospital with, you know, we have a beautiful echo lab, but we always have problem with transportation. So it's so difficult to move these patients. So I found in this study how 
that what is the solution to this problem. And this is how we <laughs> transported the patients in our study to go from side uh, to side. So in order to, to finish, uh, let me tell you that these uh, small machines are lightweight, of course, pocket size. They are very cost effective. They are really a true adjunct to clinical examination. They can be used daily. You can really put them in your pocket and so on. And the, the limitations are sort of nice when you look at them in a table, but they have low resolution, of course. But they are pretty good if you know how to use them. They have a small screen size. They, they, you cannot do Doppler. You cannot do hemodynamic measurements. They're not reimbursable. But I think there's going to be a huge type of discussion trying to find where do these devices really fit, who's going to use them. But I think that we as an eco community need to embrace this because this is here. It's not going away and it's becoming better and better all the time. Thank you.